Okay, let's get started. The good news is we finished module one. Um, uh, we want to kind of go over quickly, but uh, because the last lecture was a little short, we're also actually within our lab, we are learning how to do single cell RNA-seq. We're just learning it a few weeks or sometimes a few days ahead of you guys. And so um, some of the things I just kind of want to do a quick recap. Uh, property of TSNI. So because TSNI is computationally expensive, so we need some re dimension reduction first. <laughs> and um, in some sense, in a TSNI, we are, remember, um, multi-dimensional scaling. We are trying to use a two dimension to capture the distance between a pair of genes, right? Um, whereas for TSNI, we're also trying to capture the distance between genes, except that we project their distance into a normal distribution so that things that are really close by, now you can have better resolution of their distance, but things that are really far away, it doesn't really matter as much. Therefore, the distance on a TSNI plot, especially for the long distance clusters, they are not supposed to scale, whereas the distance with the very close by ones, so TSNI really aim to try to separate things that are more uh, close by. And you can imagine the, it's like a force directed graph between every pair of sample, there are some distance it's trying to balance as well as the distance with all the other cells. And so this process is trying to find the equilibrium in order to converge on something. That's why it's pretty like computationally intensive. And, and once you have this uh, uh, distance calculated, you, you can draw this in a 2D map. It helps to visualize the data, but really it does not explicitly identify or partition the cells into a cluster. And also if you just run TSNI, all the dots are just black and you label them uh, by different colors by saying, okay, these cells are yellow, those cells are orange and so on. Or you can label each cell by the expression of a one particular gene or a particular expression signature in that, particular, in that dot. Yeah, so it, it doesn't automatically assign colors, okay? Um, and one thing we kind of mentioned very quickly um, so by the way, a lot of these could also change, you know, um, as the, the tools are under development. So for example, by this time, microarrays, nobody's still developing methods on microarrays. RNA-seq, I would say over the last 10 years, um, every year the tools for RNA-seq changed. Uh, but this year we pretty much use the same as last time. But you can see single cell RNA-seq, you will still see a lot of tools changing. And even if we read a paper and it says the tool is implemented like that in the paper, it doesn't mean the tool is still actually implemented that way because they will you know, see new papers, they, they get incorporated. So how this um, cluster works, you can imagine see still here, um, there are some links here about how similar two cells are. Um, but in a single cell, you can also imagine there are some, uh, so you can imagine some of the cells, they will have an edge to each other. For example, you can use graph structure from KNN, so each cell finds its closest neighbor of some, of some sort. Or you say, you know, if they have, they share enough neighbors, or they, they have a similar enough expression correlation, you can connect them with a link, right? So you can imagine now this is a initially a big network. But then um, we want to partition them into quasi or whatever little modules or, or clusters. There are a number of ways to do this. One is, for example, if you have a cluster initial, like a, you, you look at one node, you ask, okay, what are all the other nodes connected to it? And you can decide a cutoff, for example, in this case is 0.7, and you say, okay, I will keep all the other nodes if this thing is connected to 70% of all the other nodes. And so you can remove those that are, you know, kind of singletons or not well connected enough to other ones. And so you remove this one and you look at the remaining one to say, are they connected to enough to all the other nodes? And if you do, you can kind of prune your nodes. So at the end, you will have some more 
cliques or you know, self-contained little clusters. So you can imagine the, if the original data look like this, you can also do similar ways to iteratively identify small clusters. And um, this would be similar to the tight clustering that we mentioned in each, like earlier in the semester for like k-means cluster. Um, but in this situation is you need to have some resolution to decide how similar do you want your cluster to be, right? So you will see in the Surat tool, if you set a higher resolution, you are requiring the cells within the cluster to be more similar to each other. They all have to be interconnected. Then you will end up with more different clusters. But if you have a lower resolution, it would mean that each cluster is much bigger even if they are not so similar to each other. Okay, but so you can see these kind of tools are still under fast development. Okay, um, yeah, so basically Surat just try to use or get insight from other published papers and also try to implement some tool that can run fast and generate some clustering. And so um, when you visualize uh, using TSNI, the clustering is done using this type of graph-based, network-based way to identify the, the tight clusters in some sense, okay? And you can set the resolution to decide how similar do you want each cluster within to be. The next thing um, is really even newer. Um, there are also still solutions being implemented, and we just want to show you one, which is a batch effect. For example, if you draw blood from one, one individual, this is PBMC, it's like it has, you know, in your blood, you have T cells, B cells, myeloid, you know, diff different things, and it has RNA, and you just take another person, and this person will pr pretty much have similar si ty type of cells. But if you try to analyze the original data, uh, first of all, these might be coming from different blood draws, different patients, and different runs, different, at least different single cell suspension. So at the end, you might end up with situations like this. Uh, this is one patient, one cell type. This is the other patient for the, for the same cell type. And they're not clustered. This is, you know, like, so yeah, so you can see here, the color indicates cell type, but really you see two clusters because you have two, two patients. They don't really align together at all. And um, uh, this is another situation. You can see, you know, batch one is all red and batch two is, is all green. They just don't overlay, even though you think, you know, most of the time our blood should have similar number of cell types. They don't overlay with each other. And so currently Surat is using something called canonical correlation analysis uh, in order to try to remove the batch effect that you can see that they mix together. So the idea is supposedly you have one patient uh, from, from one person. These are all the genes. So from X1 to XP, and then from another patient, every you have a lot of cells. You have you know Y1 to, to YQ. The P and Q do not even need to completely match up. For example, say you process the sample. Remember, for a single cell, there is a big dropout. So within each cell, you only detect about two to 3,000 genes. But when you process, say, 3,000 cells, at the end, you end up with 10,000 genes. But if you were to do the same experiment for another guy, maybe instead of three, you know, you try to put in the same number of cells in there. Afterwards, you might end up being, getting 4,000 cells. And depending on how deep you sequence, at the end, you might have 12,000 genes in that big matrix, even though it's fairly sparse, right? So you can imagine the P and Q didn't even have to be the same. They don't have to be the same dimension. Remember, for microarray, you always have the same number of genes. But for single cell, well, they are like all in different, yeah, from one patient to the other patient, you might be detecting different number of genes, right? But interestingly, uh, this, this part is kind of similar to the PCA. You are trying to create a weighting on the different genes. Uh, so this is like one dimension uh, projection. This is another dimension projection of, of all the cells in the first patient. And you're also trying to 
have another projection on the second patient. You know, every gene is given a weight. You project it in one way, you project, project in another, another way. By the way, each projection needs to be orthogonal to the other. They are kind of independent. But then, then you can calculate what is the agreement between the two the top dimensions. So in some sense, you do want to capture the you, you, you do want to capture the, the variability of the different cells in one population, the variabilities of the, the gene expression variability in the second population, but then we're trying to calculate a covariance between these two to say that if we assume that most of the data are kind of similar, should be comparable, at least they should have similar type of cell populations, can we try to make this projection to be more similar? So we find the largest possible correlation between two sets of linear combinations. So this is CCA analysis will kind of automatically find the projection so that U1 have good correlation with V1 and U2 will have good correlation with V2. And this is what they are trying to do in this uh, CCA uh, in the surat, you can see after you, you, you project them, now you do the, I guess the V1 versus the, the projected level. You can see now uh, the purple now from the two patients kind of clustered together. This, uh, the, the other cell type between the two patients, they do cluster together. And this is a, a, a third cell type they cluster together, but you know, maybe, there are still differences in one cell type that's different between the two individuals. Then you can see them, right? Uh, this is another example. Originally, the, the samples really cluster by batch. They don't really cluster by the cell type, but if you normalize them correctly, you will see, okay, actually now, this is probably one cell type, this is another cell type, this is another cell type. And, and then you can really look at whether, you know, maybe in patient one, do you have more like this cell type or, or the other cell types? Okay, so um, I would say a lot of these tools are still under development. They're also competing algorithms and also Surat, they continue to evaluate published algorithm to see which one is getting better and they try to just incorporate those ideas into the tools. And so we just have to keep learning and, and uh, trying and see whether it works. Um, so a lot of this, if you search for websites, you can see new tools and it's good to try out. We will not ask you guys to try this in the homework, but you can imagine if we teach you enough tools that you, know, you have struggled with, you have played around, you have learned from the README, hopefully you can now uh, not be scared about learning a new tool or a new feature, okay? Yeah, so, the, the nice thing about the single cell RNA-seq is that, well, the, the technology and the algorithm is under really fast development. And the experiment is actually getting cheaper and cheaper. Mm -hmm. Per cell cost is, so basically right now you can buy a machine uh, from the company and you buy some reagent, they will do the single cell suspension and make the library and then I think once this become more and more popular, there will be other companies. It's, it's like early day Illumina. They, they sell the reagent really, really expensively. But later on, other companies like New England Biolabs decided, okay, there's enough money to be made. They will make the reagent. And other people can use their reagent to make the library and then sequence on Illumina machine. Right? So this, I think, we'll, we'll, we'll see them happening. Um, and especially since there is a machine, because used to be, it's like a cDNA microarray, you know, PhD students have to spot those arrays, but once you have the commercial affymetrics array, everybody can just do this in a core facility. And this is really happening now. Um, for example, within the Harvard campus, there are a few of those uh, molecular biology core facilities that have a 10x genomics machine. You get your samples ready, you, you send, you. Usually right now, these samples need to be prepared fresh. You, know, you, you even draw blood, you get the tissue samples, and you bring them to directly to this machine and get them processed right away. And sequencing now is getting much, much cheaper. Usually for a, for a single cell RNA-seq, um, remember 10x genomics at the maximum, it can process 10,000 cells at a time. 
But when you run a sample, you usually have a few thousand, you know, three, five thousand cells. And then usually people just sequence a whole flow cell, uh, sorry, whole lane on, say, uh, high seek, which you will get about 500 million pairs of fragments. And you can see if you have, uh, you know, 500 million fragments divided by 500, sorry, 5,000 cells, you do get a good number of reads per cell to get good readout. And sequencing uh, now for a, a lane on high seat costs below $1,500, I think you can do that. And so nowadays doing a single cell RNA-seq is like 10 years ago doing a bulk RNA-seq. And that's how fast this is really moving. And you do learn a lot of uh, information, but then now you can see a lot more data is generated for the same cost. Uh, I remember uh, when cDNA microarray was first invented, a lot of the experimental postdocs were really, really good with Excel spreadsheet. Because at that time you spot like a few thousand spots, right? Each gene is one spot and different samples are different columns. And actually most of the experimental postdocs use Excel spreadsheet better than us. We were trying to write at that time Perl and later Python codes to kind of analyze this, right? Um, it was when Affymetrix array came around, when you have six million rows, they were like, okay, forget it. We should really talk to a computational biologist. <laughs> um, so in this case now, you can imagine 10x genomics with every run, you have 500 million reads. And then even if you use Cell Ranger to convert into a gene matrix, right, you get uh, basically this matrix would be each cell has gene X, gene Y, you know, gene Z, those numbers. But it's a huge mm -hmm. sparse matrix, right? And so at that level, definitely, you will need some algorithm to look at it, which is really, um, I, I think computational biology would be very, very important. And um, in fact, I, I got inspired by a talk from a colleague, and he's like, there's going to be so much single cell RNA-seq data generated soon that you don't even need to bother looking at bulk RNA-seq anymore in the future. Because the, the whole... Uh, geo, uh, so the gene expression omnibus is a public in like a, a NCBI server. Basically, if you use federal money funding to generate the data for a publication, it's required that you deposit your data into the central repository. And in this whole geo, there is probably in the order of 50,000 to 10,000 RNA-seq samples, and probably equal number of microarrays. But you can imagine if every single cell experiment can generate like 5,000 cells, right? That expression data will come much, much faster, which is very exciting. In addition, single cell RNA-seq technique currently has been combined with other techniques, for example, um, CRISPR screens, proteomics, and ataxic. In fact, we haven't talked about any of these yet, but we will talk about at least CRISPR screens and ataxic later in this semester. And so, you know, I think in the early days, some people might be rejecting genomics, but as genomics get bigger and, you know, like cheaper and faster, it's just so much more powerful to investigate things. The people who initially refuse it, they will see themselves getting even further and further away because now it's not just one genomics, it's, Genomic experiment one, adding genomic experiment two and a genomic experiment three in the same sample, right? One after another. And so um, I think we should all embrace the technology development rather than resisting it, okay? Um, yeah, so that's the first part.